Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, China. We know how growth is tapering off, but has the property bubble burst too? Or maybe the government's just shaking out irresponsible lenders. We find out what's going on in Chinese suburbia. Also this week, fake drugs in Bangladesh and their victims. Unsurprisingly, it is some of the poorest people in the world who get hit the hardest. And Ghana's illegal gold mines destroying land, polluting water. But while miners need jobs, the government's getting tough. Property in China isn't something we'd usually delve into that much, maybe only because it doesn't grab headlines like property bubbles and subprime mortgages do elsewhere. But to every rule, there is an exception, and here it is. There are now widespread fears China's property market could be heading for a bust because the last two downturns, the government provided a financial boost to reignite the economy. But this time it's different. This time the government's not willing to play backstop as it tries to manage a wider economic slowdown. The real estate sector actually accounts for about a fifth of China's GDP. And the building of new homes has fallen almost 25% in the last 12 months. And with that, house prices have gone too, down almost 8% in the first four months of this year because of that glut of unsold properties. The problem is all the contradictions. The government wants urbanisation, but new developments have become ghost towns because country folk can't afford them. Property developers have taken loans from so-called shadow banks, but those shadow banks have been indirectly funded by the state once. And local governments have got debts, but they can't finance them without land sales. Whatever happens, the economy will be hurt. The IMF estimates every 1% decline in real estate investment wipes half a percent from overall growth. Here's how we'll look at it this week, from inside China and outside, with Wayne Hay in Brisbane, Australia. But first, Adrian Brown in Yingkou, China. It is new cities like Yingkou that offer clues as to what's happening in China's economy. And the picture is a worrying one. It is five years since the property bubble burst here, and there is still no sign of a recovery. Just one business is open in this otherwise empty apartment and shopping complex. The owner moved in two years ago after paying three years' rent in advance. This is just the wrong time. I was told a lot of people would move here to live, but it didn't happen. This block of apartments has been standing empty for five years. The developer fled before work finished, saddling the government with the debt. It's a situation that's been replicated in other parts of the country. In Yinko, the chickens really have come home to roost. A collapse in Chinese property values has been predicted many times in the past. And on each occasion, the doomsayers have been proved wrong. The difference now is the number of homes standing empty, with some economists saying the figure could be at least 50 million. Some developers are panicking. Buy three flats and get one free, says this sign. Estate agents do their best to talk up Yinko's prospects. She's showing me the model of an apartment which I'm told would be an ideal investment. The down payment, $4,000. Not much moves, even during rush hour. But Yinko has to succeed. It was chosen as a special economic zone almost 10 years ago by the man who's now Prime Minister, Li Keqiang which is perhaps why a local government official only reluctantly agreed to go on camera. Our locations, industries, environment, our policies are all the best compared with many cities in northeast China, including so-called ghost towns. Those cities cannot compare to us. There are occasionally crowds here. On a summer's evening, people from the old city venture into the new one. For now, though, happy to visit rather than live here. Bid now, forever hold your peace. Australian property values may have cooled slightly last month, but it's still a hot market. 600,000. 730. 730, that's a man on the mission. Good bid, sir. The International Monetary Fund says it's one of the world's most expensive. It's a difficult time to be searching for that perfect home. It's been very stressful. What you go through? Not sure what the price is going to be and what levels and what reserves are going to be. It's, uh, yeah, it's a stressful experience. 
One of the reasons for the inflated market is an influx of money from Asia. We very much have embraced uh, the activity from uh, the Asian market and we're seeing uh, buyers that are coming to our auctions continually uh, that are competing and pushing local buyers uh, either to pay a little bit more uh, and or securing the property over and above where the local buyers are seeing value. It's raised a debate in Australia about Asian investment. People are questioning who's actually doing the buying, Australian residents or speculators sitting in other countries. Australian law states that non-residents or temporary visa holders can only buy vacant land or brand new houses. They can't buy existing older homes. But there's a perception out there that there are many people finding ways around the law. Peter Huang is from southern China but now calls Brisbane home. He's a property investor and agent who specializes in selling homes to Chinese investors. Overseas young students, uh, they bought for investments and uh, most likely their parents' money. They're able to get around the law by developing the property within two years. He says Australians shouldn't be worried about increased Chinese investment. Generally, most of the people, I think they should be grateful instead of have concerns. So, unless because most of us Australian people own their property already. Therefore, everyone's investment goes up, but at the same time, it makes life increasingly expensive for buyers. So it's interesting, isn't it? Money from China going into places like Australia, but problems at home for the Chinese property market. Let's try to make some sense of it. Joined via Skype from Shanghai by Frank Chen, the executive director of CBRE Research. Frank, thanks for your time. Can you explain what's going on with this property market in China? It appears that it's this, the second tier cities, which you might call them, the less developed cities that are getting the hardest hit. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, from late last year, there were, we have witnessed a slowdown in the property market, uh, in the China domestic property market. And basically, the transaction volume has come down quite significantly. And as you mentioned in your uh, documents, uh, in your documents, uh, you know, especially for new constructions, uh, it slipped mm -hmm. by over uh, one quarter uh, in the first quarter of this year. So. Uh, and also, I guess uh, the key reason is because partly because of the economic slowdown, but also, you know, there is a tighter credit market conditions in China as well. So is the government managing to manage this slowdown? We know about the wider economy, how it wants to have a bit of a soft landing and obviously not fall right off a cliff. Is it managing to do the same thing with the property market? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, actually, as you might notice, uh, in May this year, the people's uh, Bank of China, which is the uh, central bank, they step up to issue a note, a statement to uh, to urge the domestic commercial banks to provide liquidity to the first home buyers. And also, as you notice, uh, there are a number of local governments. They have been uh, trying to relax the home purchase restriction, uh, which is the most severe measures uh, so far. And I think the market in some uh, 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 second-tier cities have stabilized a little bit in the last uh, month or so. Okay, so the government's sort of playing the game of how much we stimulate, how much we help, because it doesn't, I guess, want to help too much, then you start uh, distorting the market again. Absolutely. I uh, totally agree with your point. I think uh, the government really is uh, learning the lessons from the 2009 uh, stimulating measures because, mm -hmm. you know, after that, they uh, relaxed all the measures in 2009, and all of a sudden, the, the property market had another booming time in 2009 and 2010. And after that, they are trying to control with some more uh, austerity measures. So uh, they definitely don't want to repeat that kind of, uh, kind of mistake again. Problems in other property markets in other parts of the world have had huge effects. I'm obviously thinking the big stuff like subprime mortgages in the US, which effectively triggered the financial crisis in the global financial crisis. Now, I guess we're not in the same boat here with China, but should there be any concern from the outside world about this property slowdown in China and the wider effect it might have? OK, I think uh, for the China situation, I would say it's quite different from the uh, US subprime market. First of all, you know, uh, the holding power of the Chinese buyers is quite different because, you know, in China, the minimum down payment for first home buyers is 30%. And for second home buyers, the minimum down payment in a lot of cities is 60%. So that means that on average, uh, the every, uh, every home payers 
uh, home buyers, they need to pay a down payment of around 40 to 50 percent mm. from their own uh, with their own equity. But if you look back in uh, at the peak of the financial uh, of the subprime crisis in 2006 and 2007 in the states, a lot of time people don't have to pay any down uh, down payments. So the, you know the holding power is quite different, and also uh, you know. Uh, uh, there are a lot of liquidity in the system as well. The M2 has been uh, M2 in China has been growing rapidly in the last uh, 13 years. At the beginning of the century, uh, the M2 in China was only about 13 trillion RMB, but by the beginning of this year, it was over 110 trillion RMB. So there is a lot of liquidity in the system, and the holding power is quite different as well. Frank, just quickly, you would have heard our second report from Australia showing the amount of Chinese money and Chinese investors going into the uh, Australian property market. Who are those people? Are those, are those the affluent ones who can afford to? Because, you know, we've been talking about people not being able to buy back at home and yet the money's going overseas. I would say most of these uh, individual buyers, I would say they are the high net worth individuals. And uh, as you already out, because of the introduction of the home purchase restriction uh, domestically, a lot of time these people they find very limited investment channels, and that's part of the reason why they go overseas to purchase properties in cities like Sydney, New York, or London. And uh, the other reason I believe is because they are out of the uh, concern for diversification as well. Frank Chen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. And still ahead on counting the cost, the gold mines of Ghana, illegal, but still being operated because, well, people need a job, don't they? That story a little later on. Remember last week we talked about the French bank BNP Paribas facing a $10 billion fine for breaking US sanctions in its dealings with Iran and Sudan. Well, it's not the only one facing such hefty fines. Other international banks, including Britain's Barclays, are curtailing their activities in some emerging markets to avoid clashing with U.S. regulators. Barclays has been attempting to shut down services to a number of remittance companies, the money transfer operators, because of concerns those networks could be used for money laundering and terrorism. But money transfer companies are, well, they're two things. They're big business and they're vital business. There are countries, the Philippines certainly springs to mind, where remittance accounts for almost 10% of the economy. Well, let's bring in the CEO of Africa's biggest remittances company, Abdirashid Douali, is from Dahab Shield, and he joins us from London this week. Abdi, let's start with the issue of Barclays uh, planning to, well, let's say, step aside. What sort of progress have you made in finding a new partner there? We had an agreement with Barclays Bank that's an interim agreement and uh, we have been talking to other banks and, um, and still we are in discussion with some banks and uh, we hope we'll find a solution uh, very soon. Okay, then I'm interested in talking a bit more about the idea of, of remittances or, or, or simply the, the money transfer companies as they are, because there has been, and this is perhaps in the West more, a bit of a perception problem, I think. People think, oh, well, this is how people send money around the world. This is how they do dodgy transactions if they want to. How do you sort of allay any of the fears that may exist about money transfer companies? Well, uh, I, I can talk about the Shill, and we are the Shill, a fully regulated company here in the UK uh, and also in the US. And, uh, you know, we help the African diaspora community who want to help their families. Uh, the average transaction that we deal with is $200. Uh, and it's not only we uh, serve the African diaspora, we also serve international communities like uh, 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 charities that work in the regions like the UN, United Nations, Oxfam and others. So for us as the Habshil, you know, we, we, we respect the regulations and rules where we operate and, um, and our community is the key uh, for providing the lifeline service that we offer to them. I, I'm glad you used the word lifeline there because that was the exact word I was actually going to use. I don't think we're going too far to say that these are lifelines for Africa uh, and, and African people because, well, tell us about the amount, huge amounts of money. Well, uh, the, I mean, the remittance coming from uh, the diaspora community and going to Africa, it's a different estimate. Some people estimate to be 24 billion American dollars. The contribution that 
African diaspora are making back to their homeland, whether it's investment, whether it's tourism, whether it's uh, remittance going back to. And, uh, and, and, you know, remittance can come from different kind. You know, uh, you know if, you, if you send some clothes to your family, it's part of contribution in a way. So that's why the Im immigrant communities that uh, live here in the UK and other Western world are key to the development of their home countries. Uh, and sometimes even the security depends on uh, remittance coming from the diaspora. A country like Somalia, where uh, the national economy of the country, in a way, rely on remittance coming from the country like UK and the United States and Middle East also, it is, um, it is uh, important for the national economy. I guess it's important as well because you've probably got money going into parts of Africa where there's no... Uh, banking system, you know, 30, 40 percent, I believe, actually, in these rural areas, remittances go there where there is no what we might call conventional banking system. Absolutely. And uh, it's not only about actually the rural uh, uh, communities, even in certain towns, if you go to Nairobi or if you go to Uganda or if you go to at the suburb, you don't have everywhere a bank, big bank. In fact, you don't have a, some certain area, no bank at all. And it is those kind of communities that rely on companies like the Habshil to receive uh, money from their uh, loved one in the, in the diaspora uh, in a matter of hours. And, uh, and the price that's reasonable, if somebody sends you $200 and they, they, they really don't have a lot of money to, to help their family. Many of those people are, people are poor and they don't have other income, so they rely on receiving $200 or $100 from their families. And, uh, and that's why companies like the Habshil have been working in that market for nearly 20 years, and we are happy to continue offer that. Uh, of course, in the Western country, there's a challenges, and in the name of terrorism and uh, all of these different regulations are affecting certain communities to send many back home. And that's why the UK government has been set up some kind of corridor to address that. But our only, our only concern is that we're very grateful what they are doing. But we, all we ask them is to hurry up because, you know, this is a lifeline and we want, you know, community to help their families instead of solution coming next year or, or two years' time. We need a solution now, you know, and, uh, and that's the only thing we can say about this. Here's my concern coming from everything you've said, Abdi, and it's the fact that if there's this much money coming in from remittances, and we know there's a lot of money coming in as well from development aid, for example, I wonder if all of this could end up sort of masking the real levels of of natural organic growth that there are in Africa. Now, recently, you know, you hear things about how Nigeria, for example, has become the biggest economy in Africa. Well, that's great, but if it's being masked by all this other money coming in, what's the real growth story in Africa? Uh, well, you're right. Uh, a lot of African countries, the economy is growing, and uh, it doesn't have to be dependent on remittance. You know, if you go to Rwanda or Kenya or Ethiopia or Nigeria, you know, a lot of African countries, the economy is much better than, than it was five years ago, ten years ago. And uh, and and what I'm, uh, from the, where I'm coming from, the diaspora angle, you know, uh, diaspora has a contribution to play to the economy of those countries, whether it's Nigeria or any other countries. They they invest back to the country, and you know, if you go to Addis Ababa or Nairobi or, or, or Uganda, you will see you know uh, buildings and uh, people invest in property, and many of them are from the diaspora. Whether it's they call it London Center or New York Center or Sydney, you know, you can see the link from the diaspora, and and many of them use companies like the Habshil. So that's why the diaspora really are playing an important role. And all I can say is that the African countries they should encourage the investment coming from the diaspora. I think they should uh, help them in terms of getting the proper ID and documents that they need. I think they should help them to encourage them and uh, you know invite them to. Uh, uh, investment opportunities that they can invest, you know, and I think diaspora, yes, they still want to maintain the link in the diaspora, like myself. I'm a British citizen, I love UK, it's my country, but as well as I love Africa and I want to invest and I want to go back to whenever I can. So I think many diaspora community are uh, that kind of group who want to be part of the development of their home country as well as here. Abdi Rashid Duali talking remittances with us on Counting the Cost. Thanks, Abdi. To Bangladesh now, in a case of counterfeit medicine. You know, the World Health Organization estimates nearly 10% of all drugs sold worldwide are fake. And in Bangladesh, it's a problem that refuses to go away. Maha Sattar sent us this report from Tangail, where he met victims of fake drugs, most of them the rural poor. Every day, Hosniara goes to visit her baby's grave. 
She says she can't believe he's gone and that it happened so quickly. She'd taken her child to a hospital because he was sick. Then her world fell apart. The doctor has put a needle into his hand to give him an injection. And I saw with my own eyes, his hand started to go dark and it moved up towards his head and my baby screamed and then went quiet. That's when I started to cry. But the doctor told me to stop crying and leave the room. I asked, why should I? You killed my boy. Three other children also died that day in the same hospital from the same sort of injection. Medicine can be really cheap in Bangladesh. I just bought 10 tablets from this village pharmacy and it cost me only $2. It's almost 100 pills. However, that does mean that a lot of people are cutting corners. The government says that there are pharmacies selling substandard, expired, and even fake medicine, especially in the villages. In 2009, 24 children died after taking contaminated paracetamol, a mild over-the-counter painkiller. But the worst outbreak took place between 1990 to 1992, when 339 deaths were reported, also due to contaminated paracetamol. This is Mitford Market. It's Bangladesh's largest wholesale medicine hub. The government has called it the ground zero of counterfeit pharmaceuticals. It seized fake medicine worth more than half a million dollars in raids of the market over the last year. But the traders here are defined and have threatened to shut down sales of all medicines if the raids continue. There are no fake medicines at this market. The government picks on us because they want the attention. We just sell the medicines. We don't make them. The health ministry estimates there are 16,000 unlicensed pharmacies in the country, mostly in rural areas. The government says it is trying to shut down illegal dispensaries. It's action that's long overdue, but it could save many mothers from sharing the heartbreak felt by Hosne Ara. Finally this week, gold in Ghana. Despite the country's efforts to shut down illegal mines, the lack of jobs means many return to illegal operations. And in doing so, they're polluting waterways and destroying land and local communities. Amma Boateng has this report. These young men are hard at work mining for gold in the eastern region of Ghana. What they're doing is illegal. They haven't gone through the stringent process of trying to get a license, but they're here with the consent of the landowner. Illegal mining, or galamse as it's called here, is taking place in countless sites like this across Ghana. The miners don't want to be filmed, but the leader of this group agreed to talk to us about why they're doing this. But this galamse here, at least every day you can get something to uh, feed your, your family. And that's why everybody is putting himself, and I'm pushing himself into this system, to support your life. You see, that's it. But the work is dangerous. Is, is it worth it? It's so dangerous. Oh, OK, if you take good care of it, uh, it's not so much dangerous, as you are saying. They divert entire waterways in search of gold, and once they finish with the site, they often just abandon it. The small-scale miners who are licensed and regulated are required to reclaim the land. This group have been here for about a month now, and they say in the next few days they're actually going to be wrapping up. Now, they also say they're going to reclaim this land, but from what we've seen in this area so far, that just doesn't seem to be happening. This is just one of the abandoned sites we came across. And this is what's left of the River Brim, which runs through the area of Chebi. The methods the illegal miners use make the water murky and too dirty for the local community to use. They normally treat with mercury and then cyanide. And these chemicals are also deadly for our health. Bear in mind that the water they are dealing with are for drinking purposes. The boss of the government body in charge of regulating the mining industry admits that more needs to be done to tackle the problem. We were not firm enough to stem the, 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 the problem when it started. We did not nip it in the bud. So I think it is now for us to deal with it. We need the, the, the traditional leadership to be involved. We need the district assemblies to be involved. We need the, the public, the mindset, the public support. The threat of arrest or prosecution is no deterrent for the illegal operators. The police regularly catch some of the miners. The bill for the environmental cleanup is likely to run into millions of dollars, but it's not clear who will pay for it. And that is our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com. You just click through to the programs link and from there you'll find the Count to the Cost page. It's got all our previous episodes for you to catch up on. You can get in touch as well. You can tweet either me at Kamal AJE. Uh, there's our business editor at Abid Oliver Ali. And don't forget to use the hashtag Count the Cost when you do. Or just drop us an email. Count the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. 
But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.